The day will come. Okay. You will have grandchildren. I'm setting a scene. All right. And your first grandchild comes up to you and says, Grandpa, mm -hmm. I understand you wrote a book about an author which I am about to read mm -hmm. in class called Harper Lee. Mm -hmm. And says, Grandpa, tell me about what, why you did what you did and what did you learn? That's a very open question. But uh, if your audience is your grandson, let's say. All right. Well, I, I begin by saying that um, the reason I wrote the book was because of young people like my grandchildren. Uh, when I taught To Kill a Mockingbird to high school students, they would want to know more about the author. And usually when you introduce a major American literary figure, you're able to give some background, whether you're teaching uh, Pose the Raven or Old Man in the Sea, you can always do something about the author. Not so in Harper Lee's case. Uh, if you look up Lee Harper in an encyclopedia, there'll usually be a couple of paragraphs about the author. And that only whets young people's appetite. They want to know, well, first of all, is Harper Lee a man or a woman? Uh, did he or she live through these times? Was there really an adequate atticus? How autobiographical is this? Um, and the more I tried to get into the mystery of, of Harper Lee, uh, where did the author spring from, or what was her background, how did this book come to be, the more intrigued I, intrigued I became. Then when I found out that there had never been a biography of Harper Lee, I thought, this is a, an obvious gap on library shelves under nonfiction biography. Uh, there has never been a life of the author of one of the most popular books of the 20th century. How is this possible? So uh, what I would say to my grandchild is, is that you're about to embark on a journey about um, what this country was like, uh, the potential that it, it had at that time, uh, the vision that the author had for what a just and fair country could be, but some of the hurdles that we as Americans were facing 75 years ago. 1935 is the setting of the book. How much did you have to go into research 1935, lifetimes, segregation, and, and the judicial system? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm fortunate in that I, I have a master's degree in American history, and my specialty was the South. So I had always been intrigued by the peculiar institution of slavery and the treatment of blacks in the South. And I was very familiar with the, um, the Reconstruction era, the New South and that whole movement. So I, I didn't have to steep myself in that period, although I was born in Philadelphia and raised in Chicago. Uh, it felt very familiar to me once I began reading Southern newspapers and began talking to people from the Deep South. Um, but um, I was also primed to do this by the fact that when you teach this novel today, you have to acclimate young people to the period and the terminology. Uh, my students in the 1980s thought that segregation was some kind of quaint southern custom. Uh, they didn't and had never heard of the black laws. Mm -hmm. They weren't aware that uh, Calpurnia in To Kill a Mockingbird had a family of her own mm -hmm. that she had to go to every night. And then when Atticus turned to her and said, can you stay tonight, Calpurnia? Uh, she was sacrificing going home and making dinner for her own children. So I had to make them aware of the of the, the, the symbiosis and the, the, the strange uh, networks that were available in the South before we could get into, you know, why, why it was so wrong to pr prosecute Tom Robinson, despite the fact that he was a decent man, a good man, a law-abiding man. He still had to be made an example of. That's hard for a lot of students to understand. You start the book where they, or the two the book, but uh, Harper Lee starts the book with a one sentence attributed to Charles Lamb. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Well, she says that lawyers, were, I once were children too. And I think she's uh, alluding to the uh, idea that uh, perhaps we lose our innocence as we, we grow older and we adhere more to the letter of the law and less to the spirit of the law. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's the choice that Atticus has to make at the end of the book when um, he has the choice, he has a decision to make, which is whether to have um, Boo Radley arrested and tried and put on display 
and made a, a freak in town, or whether justice has been done and the circle's been completed, and he decides that in the, the nature of justice is that it has all been settled now, mm -hmm. through maybe even some kind of invisible hand. The justice system, by the way, I'll just give you a little uh, information of this area and an exhibit that you will see at the Jackson Center. It's an exhibit on Elbian Tourget. Mm -hmm. Elbian Tourget was from Chautauqua County. Elbian Tourget was the attorney who represented Homer Plessy. Mm -hmm. and Plessy, Plessy versus Ferguson. Ferguson. Yes. And his briefs, opinions, etc., are all in a, a library not too far from here, and part of that is on display here. So you've got Plessy versus Ferguson, mm -hmm. and then you have a series of judicial matters, especially in the South, separate but equal, which ultimately work its way to Brown versus Board, which ultimately works its way into, you know, at the time of which Harper Lee is writing in the mm -hmm. late 1950s. How, how much of that series of events played in your teaching of Harper Lee, and how much do you think Harper Lee uh, understood the judicial legislator, the, the judicial process? Well, you had to really go through the court systems. Well, Harper Lee was only one quarter short of graduating from law school at the University of Alabama, mm -hmm. so she was deeply familiar with the nature of the judicial system in the United States and constitutional law. Um, she had a deep background in, in uh, the legal history of this country, and I think that's why she was able to create such a convincing uh, trial uh, and make such a uh, convincing attorney of Atticus Finch. Although she watched her father argue cases, and then although she listened to dinner table conversation, she also needed the deep background, I think, to persuade us that uh, a lot was at stake. You know, Hemingway one time said that the writer shows you, the reader, one-third of the iceberg sticking above the water. He knows two-thirds of what's below the water. Uh, and uh, you don't need to see all that, but he or she needs to know that mm -hmm. in order to give you the, the, the compression necessary for real drama. Harper Lee, the person, mm -hmm. obviously you didn't have access to her. Uh, did you try? Oh yes, yeah I did. Um, somebody did kind of an end run on me initially, which was this. My agent and I shopped around my book proposal to 12 different publishers in New York. And uh, a number of them were interested. Somehow, somebody, uh, in an effort to curry favor with Harper Lee, sent her a Xerox copy of all 95 pages of my proposal, including two sample chapters and a list of people I planned to interview. And um, they sent it to her FedEx to make sure she got it quick. Now, my plan was to first get a reputable publishing house lined up, then go to her and say, listen, this isn't an idle project. Uh, you've probably been approached about a biography before, but I have a, a Random House or a Harper Collins or somebody behind me. And uh, what if we collaborate? In fact, if you don't want to do too much work on it, I'll give you the whole manuscript at the end, and you make marg marginal notes, mar notes in the margin about what's wrong, what should be corrected, and I'll address those things. We never even got to that point. She, she, uh, my mother calls it being in a state of high dudgeon. You know, she just immediately took offense that somebody had gone this far without her permission. So it, it probably would have worked if it, had, if it had been done my way. But as I say, somebody uh, outflanked me. Uh, she called everybody on my list that I meant to interview and asked them not to talk to me. She asked them not to share photographs. So it, it trebled the amount of work I had to do to assemble this mosaic of Harper Lee. Mm -hmm. And she commented on it, and I assume she's probably seen it. Well, I corresponded fairly regularly with her, her 96-year-old uh, sister, Alice Lee, who still goes into the law offices of uh, Barnett, Bug, and Lee three days a week. Uh, that's the law firm that her father was a partner of after World War I. This is in Monroeville? Yes, in Monroeville. And uh, we wrote back and forth a few times, and finally when the book was finished, I. I sent her a copy of the completed biography, and I sent uh, Harper Lee a nice accompanying letter. And um, here's what I heard back. Um, she tells her friends not to read it. 
<laughs> so that was the only reaction. Do you get a sense that part of the, may I say, the mystique of the book is the fact of the mystery of the author and that this is one of one. There is no more mm -hmm. books and that in turn is part of the marketing slash branding of this? She inadvertently increased interest in herself by withdrawing. Right. Um, in this country where individualism is a, a highly prized commodity, we, we are interested in celebrities. We're interested in go-it-alone types. And while she's a very authentic person who's never looked for approval, the fact that she's never sought the limelight is a complete paradox to a lot of people particularly to her deepest uh, fans. I know people who read To Kill a Mockingbird once a year, just as a treat to themselves. Mm -hmm. And they'd love to see more about Harper Lee. Now, she, may, she has never published another book, but that doesn't mean that she has never written another book. It may be that she's finished another manuscript that won't be published until after she's gone. Having tasted fame once, um, it's understandable that she may not want to go back there again. She's an elderly lady who suffered a mild stroke a year ago. She lives in the town that she grew up in. She likes to have coffee at Hardy's on Wednesday after church. Uh, that's the life she leads. Yeah. She was a major character in two Capote films recently. Yes. Uh, the, how accurate were those characterizations? They were quite different from one another. Well, you touch on an interesting point, or you touch on the exact point, which is the two characterizations were different, and I wish that if those characterizations could be pressed into a coin, uh, they, they would have the image of Harper Lee. Catherine Keener is the intellectual side of Harper Lee, a very bright, uh, plain-spoken woman. And uh, Sandra Bullock portrays the warm, storytelling southern side of Harper Lee. So if we could get uh, some of that uh, cerebra cerebral character uh, mixed with the warmth of Sandra Bullock, we would have Harper Lee. But it's two sides to her. Family members, you mentioned a sister. Are, are, there, are there other siblings? Well, her brother Edwin was with the 8th Air Force during World War II um, uh, and uh, served on um, quite a few missions overseas. Unfortunately, he died shortly after he was called up for Korea in uh, 1950 or 1951. On a hot summer day, he was playing a, a rigorous game of softball at uh, the airfield near Montgomery, and he suffered a cerebral hemorrhage. And he died at the age of about, I think, 31 or 32, leaving two children. And um, she still has a sister, though, who's alive, Louise. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Louise is in a nursing home, not far from Monroeville. There were four children, and they go in birth order this way. Alice is the eldest, she's alive, and then there was uh, uh, Edwin, and then Louise, and then no. Was the family surprised that Harper had success? Did they, they, they realize that perhaps she was a prodigy type person? Well, they, they always knew she was precocious, but it was almost an expectation in that family that you would go to college and you would do well and take school seriously. I mean, the children read the newspaper to themselves at home, uh, and uh, they had uh, huge vocabularies, and they were usually, you know, fairly popular among their peers. So uh, they weren't surprised that, that Nell was ambitious. They were surprised by the odds being stacked against her and her succeeding nevertheless. Mm -hmm. She dropped out of college. She went to New York. She got a job as, an, as a, a ticket, an airline reservationist. And uh, what are the chances of, of a young woman with a pipe dream, uh, like becoming a novelist, actually succeeding? So in the space of 10 years, she leaves the South, goes to New York, and retrieves the Pulitzer Prize. It, it was amazing. Yeah. Does she have agents now that you have to go through or does she have gatekeepers? She has an agent uh, whose name is Samuel Pincus, who uh, his office is in uh, let's see, a little bit north of New York and um, uh, you have to go through him and she's not unreasonable to deal with when it comes to uh, most requests but her, her, her 
principle about the book is this, that it's done and the characters are not to be exploited. Mm -hmm. So that she won't allow any emendations or additions to the uh, licensed play for amateur theatricals. Uh, she won't allow murals. Uh, she won't allow um, uh, plates and commemorative figures and scout the action figure and all that stuff we've come to expect. You know, the Star Wars attitude toward um, things that are popular. I, I, I got the sense that she felt comfortable about the movie, the Gregory Peck movie. Very much so, yes. Uh, watching uh, uh, a disc that was put out uh, for the making of the movie, and Gregory mm -hmm. Peck talking about uh, she on the set. I'm sure you've probably seen that uh, piece where uh, she he, he did the first scene, the very first scene she was there behind yes. the scene, and there was what he thought was a tear. Right. <laughs> and he took that as something of a compliment. Com talked to her and she responded saying, uh, he asked her, he goes, well, were you moved by the first scene, the first shot? Because uh, I saw you did a little glisten in your eye. And I was, well, no, I just looked at you and I saw that you had a pot belly like my dad. Right, and exactly. Was, was, yes, of, well, she was, she was very pleased with his performance because in her heart of hearts at the very beginning she thought he was much too good looking to play her father. Mm -hmm. He was a box office heartthrob. Uh, it was the equivalent of getting Tom Cruise to play Atticus Finch. And her father was an owlish looking man who, who looked every bit like an accountant. Mm -hmm. Rumpled suit, watch fob and chain, and here comes Gregory Peck. You know, the, the, the sonorous voice and, you know, chiseled good looks and everything like that. But it, it, it's what marks a good actor that uh, Peck was able to pick up on the mannerisms, the posture, the, the pauses, and the, the particular mannerisms that did a pretty good imitation of uh, Mr. Lee without sort of channeling him. You know, there's a difference between acting and impersonation. Uh, but I'll tell you this, when people in Monroeville went to see the film, they thought it was uncanny how much he seemed like Mr. Lee. Okay. Yeah. What about Harper Lee, mm -hmm. Scout? Did she believe that was she? You know what, I've never heard her comment on, that, uh, on the woman who played the actress, and I, I know the woman. She lives not far from me in Virginia, and we, we had a, shared a meal one time in Monroeville. And um, they, they had sort of a shipboard friendship uh, in that they've been acquainted for many years, but I don't, I don't know what Harper Lee thinks of, of Mary Badham's performance. Um, I think Mary Badham was pretty much being who she was at that time. Right. You know, she was a spunky nine-year-old who hung upside down from trees, and it, she was typecast. That's again in the disc of the how to make it, the person who played Jeff talked about Mary and, yeah. you know, she was just a... Uh, bit of a right, pill, yeah, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, he tells stories about how you many times want to just kill her. Uh, along those same lines, mm -hmm. uh, Dill being, uh, portraying Capote, did Capote ever comment on that? On the film? Yeah. Well, he was proud that he was included in her book. He wrote to friend saying that there's a beautiful new book coming out and, and I'm, I'm the character Dill. So he was quite proud of the fact. But, you know, she was uh, returning a favor, in a sense, uh, in that she's Isabel in his book, Other Voices, Other Rooms. So they figure in each other's fiction, and it's a, a little game between, between themselves. Uh, but he was, he was pleased, yeah. What was the relationship with Harper Lee and Capote, sort of after the In, in Cold Blood mm -hmm. process, of which, of course, has been portrayed in movies? Did right. they continue to be close? Well, the friendship was, was strained uh, for several reasons. Um, first of all, I think Harper Lee was very disappointed that Truman Capote downplayed her part in the creation of the book. I think she had the understanding that it was a collaborative effort. While he would take the lead, and, and he was the, you know, the presiding genius over the book, and no one can ever take that away from him, mm -hmm. she took um, 150 single-spaced typewritten pages of notes uh, and she interviewed people and she drew maps for him to refer to 
And I've even seen the final copy of the manuscript that went to the New Yorker when it was serialized. Her handwriting's in the margin, still making suggestions about how to improve things. And yet, when he was interviewed about her part in the book, he would say things like, well, she's a very warm person. It was good having her along because, you know, it, it helped me meet people. Mm -hmm. So it was always me, me, me. And then, of course, um, she didn't accept an invitation to the black and white ball, which people were just clawing to get into. I mean, all the literati and glitterati were going to be there. She didn't go. Uh, then Truman began to sort of flow out, float away into a sea of alcohol and drugs. And by the mid-1970s, he was not a friend who could be trusted mm -hmm. because he was so volcanic. She continues a relationship, Harper Lee continues a relationship with, uh, with Mrs. Peck. Yes, uh, Veronica. Yes. And I understood she even accepted a, a, an appearance. Yes, she was in Los Angeles, about, I might say about four years ago now. Yeah. Yeah. How did that go? I mean, how, how did that come about? And because, uh, and I, I get the sense that she doesn't surface that much for public events. Mm -hmm. um, Gregory Peck felt deeply indebted to Harper Lee for giving him one of one of a role that he was very very proud of. Uh, you know, an actor can't be at the top of his form unless he has the material or she has the material. And he was very proud of his, his role as Atticus Finch. And when President Johnson created the, the forerunner of the National Endowment of the Arts, which at that time was called the National Council of the Arts, and began casting around for people to put on it, Peck immediately uh, brought up the name of Harper Lee, believing that he could not only return a favor, but that she was a reliable person and he could, he could work closely with her. So uh, she was added to this uh, galaxy of stars that made up the original panel, original council. And the, the friendship went from there. I think, I think uh, Harper Lee, Lee might have been a little bit in love with Gregory Peck in the sense that uh, when she would come into a room, he would hurry over and pull out a chair for her. Yeah. And uh, they, they had a, a good, solid friendship. And so therefore, Veronica could, could sort of Pull that chip and, yes. and get her there. Right, yeah. Would she is at events, public events, does she speak? Or no. Or she just, just appear? She just appears. Uh, her speech is very short. It usually consists of thank you. Mm -hmm. And then she sits down. Is she an autograph signer? Uh, yes. She, she used to sign books fairly freely. It was a simple thing to do. But then she was disappointed to find that people resold them. Mm -hmm. Uh, she didn't know about the, the wiles of the, uh, the internet and how it can be abused. And she was flabbergasted when somebody, I think, sent her a book saying, would you please sign this for my mother? She's not well and she's a great admirer of yours. Next thing you know, it's on the eBay for $1,800. Mm -hmm. And so she quickly learned not to autograph books. And she'll only do it for very, very special reasons. For example, if, it's, if uh, someone t tells her up front that this is going to be auctioned for a cause. Right. So if you if you were if you were to write her and say this, I have my favorite cause, and would you do it for me? She probably would not do that, would she? No, oh, probably not. Yeah. I know we uh, had a chance to interview uh, Juan Williams. Yes. Yeah. Who wrote a book on Thurgood Marshall? Okay. And he didn't get access to the Marshalls. Oh, really? So, I mean, I mean, in many senses, here's this book that's quoted extensively about the life and times of Thurgood Marshall, and for reasons that he didn't want to get into, uh, conducted very, very politically. The family did not give him access to them. Oh. And you wonder, yeah. you must kind of get at that same sort of sense that you would certainly, there's, uh, whether there might be something else out there that you would have mm -hmm. picked up um, from that process. The book, you know, got rave reviews. Your book, got rave reviews. Is there things you've learned since the time of the publication of the book? You'd say, oh, if I'd only known. Um, are there things I've learned? Uh, <laughs> nothing that is worth dwelling on. I've traveled a lot. I've met people. I've picked up gossip. It's nothing that I feel needs to be included. Right. Anecdotes. Uh, I had dinner with her one time uh, that 
things like that. Right, right. Well and good, all right? But nothing that's made me slap my forehead and think, this opens a whole new door. Right. So that's all, just embellishments. Is there another book along this line for you? No, uh, on Harper Lee? Yeah. No, this was a difficult book to write right. because Harper Lee um, uh, published one book, mm -hmm. dropped out of sight, wouldn't allow me to work with her. Right. So it, it was very hard to cobble it into a, an adult level read. Right. I have the opposite problem with the book I'm working on currently. Right now I'm writing the authorized biography of Kurt Vonnegut. Oh. And Kurt and I were working together at the time of his death. He gave me the names of people I should interview. He told me sadly that all of his letters had been destroyed in a fire in his study, which was a great loss. Then it turned out that his friends had kept his letters because they were so entertaining. And I have 1,500 of them. Wow. So it's, it's uh, I just have so many riches to choose from. Not only interviews, but letters. And Kurt was an extrovert. Mm -hmm. He liked people. He gave a lot of interviews. He published 14 books. So it, it's, it's so much material that it's completely opposite problem from Harper Lee. I wince every time I, I can't include something. Right. Has she entrusted her papers to a library or a university? Or? No, she hasn't. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, Professor Houle of the Houle Library now at the University of Alabama, when he was still alive, approached her about donating the manuscript of To Kill a Mockingbird to the University of Alabama. She didn't. So I, and I don't know why that is. Vonnegut mm -hmm. spent some time here at Chautauqua. Yes. Uh, and we had dinner with him one night. And you're right. What a show. <laughs> it was, yes. it was, he, he loved folks. He loved to entertain. Yes. Uh, He's a bit of a ham. <laughs> yeah. How did you connect with, with, with Vonnegut? Uh, well, I like to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, I no sooner uh, finished the Harper Lee book than I thought, okay, what's next? And what's next? Uh, I got to keep up the momentum. Yeah. And I, uh, I, I cast around thinking about who made an impact on me when I was young. Uh, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm falling into a groove of writing about the, the, the writers of my generation. And I thought, well, what about Joseph Heller? There's never been a biography of Joseph Heller. And I started looking into him, and then I realized, you know, he was raised in a Jewish neighborhood near Coney Island. Uh, that's not my background. I, I just know I'll make a false step. Or, uh, it, it, it'll have an inauthentic ring about it, because I don't know a lot about that, that aspect of American culture. So th then I came to Vonnegut, and uh, I found out that we had a lot in common. And I wrote him a letter, and I, I said, Dear Mr. Vonnegut, um, uh, there's never been a biography about you. You had an enduring impact. Uh, my n nephew is reading all of your books. He's the third generation now. I was reading Vonnegut, uh, and I went on in you know that vein. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wrote back. He didn't write back. He sent me back a drawing of himself, and he's smoking a cigarette. Side view, and underneath it says, "This is a drawing of me demurring on your off offer to be my biographer." So I propped that up on the mantel, and I looked at it for a couple of weeks, and I thought, "Well, now this man knows words." Demuring is not a strong word. It is uh, uh, the reluctant candidate saying, no, no, I, I couldn't possibly. You know, it's the diva going off stage and saying, no, no, I, I couldn't reappear. So I wrote back to him, and I said, listen, let me, just let me have a do-over here, Mr. Vonnegut. I said, you know, you are a, you're a veteran, and my dad's a veteran, and uh, you and I grew up in the Midwest. And we did, not too far apart from each other. And I said that uh, my dad was a journalist, you were a journalist. At that time, I didn't know that he wrote for City News in Chicago. My dad was a journalist in Chicago. And I said, and you were in public relations for General Electric. My dad was in public relations for Ford Motor Company. Do you know your son Mark and I are almost exactly the same age? In fact, I read the Eden Express right before I hitchhiked out to California. And I didn't know it at the time, but his wife, Jane, had a Quaker background. And when I was growing up, I attended Quaker meetings. And I just happened to mention that. And uh, about a week passed, and I got a postcard back. Had a little drawing on the back of it, smoking a cigarette. And 
underneath it said okay and that was it and then we just he started calling me and I suddenly I was his friend and he began introducing me as his biographer and uh, he was a, 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 an odd duck in that uh, he would surprise me by calling at night when I wasn't expecting to talk to him. I mean, when I'm getting ready to interview a subject, you know, I've, I've got my crib sheet and I've done my homework, and my wife and I would be watching some old Netflix movie with Cary Grant, and the phone would ring at quarter to ten, and the other end would be this gravelly voice, Hi, it's Kurt Vonnegut. How's my biography coming? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't really ready to, you know, and I would say, well, I'm reading up on Indianapolis, and I, I talked to, you know, Knox Berger, your former editor at Collier's, and then he would just wax lyrical for about 10 minutes, and then he never said goodbye. He would just say, well, you're a nice guy, and he would hang up. Yeah. That was it. And I was at his house the day that he fell. Uh, I had just finished interviewing him. I took a cab. About an hour later, he took the dog for a walk. He tripped on the leash and he fell on the sidewalk. And a, a month later, died mm -hmm. from uh, severe head injury. Did you videotape it or you uh, audio? I audio taped audio it. Mm -hmm. Did he do bi Did he do interviews and in, uh, so that the A and E biography? Are there such things on? I, I don't know if there's an A and E biography, but I've collected a number of. Uh, he, he did the Cabot show. Uh, he was out there. Kirk he did John Stewart about seven months before he died, when um, Armageddon in retrospect. Uh, no, Man Without a Country came out. Mm -hmm. What then after that? I mean, you're on a roll. Well, after this, I think I'm going to... You're Jack Kerouac? Is no, I'm going to... I'm going to... I think I'm going to do something else besides biography. Try... Uh, I think a natural segue from this might be um, historical fiction where I can rely on research but employ more of the craft of uh, fiction writing. Mm -hmm. I won't be constrained by what actually happened. You know, Tr uh, Truman would sometimes be caught up short by his listeners and they would say, Truman, it, that's not how it happened. And he would say, well, if it didn't, it should have. <laughs> and just think, in historical fiction, you can take settings and times and riots and everything and you can put people there and have them say things that you want them to say. Flashing back to uh, Harper Lee, uh, if she were to come in this room right now and say, all right, tell me mm -hmm. what you learned about me that most surprised you. Okay. How would you answer that? How would you say that? Well, well uh, two things surprised me about her. First of all, I had no idea how much she contributed to In Cold Blood. I knew that uh, she was there in Kansas. Um, my first, the first indications that she was there quite a bit came from people in Kansas who couldn't remember how often or during what seasons she had been there. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, well, good heavens, how many times did she come? Yeah. I thought maybe she came out once. Oh, no, no, she was here Christmas. And they would start rattling off times that she'd been out there. And I thought, well, she made a point of going with Truman many times. So that I was surprised by her input into the book. The second thing that surprised me was how consistent a character she's been throughout her life. Uh, the scout that you read about, the fourth grader who punches boys in the stomach and wrestles on the playground, has become Harper Lee, the woman in her 80s, and has changed very little. She's not somebody who asks permission. She's not somebody who looks over her shoulder seeking approval. Uh, she just goes her own way. Um, and having been in the limelight and having known what it's like to be a literary lion and the next great thing. and that. You'd think that maybe it would have turned her head. It didn't. She wasn't impressed. What do her neighbors think? They treat her as a, um, just an elderly lady with white hair who covers up her chrysanthemums when the frost comes in the fall. Uh, she uh, is very much involved in her church where her father was a deacon. Uh, she gives 10% of everything that comes from the books to the church. Um, she's seen around town, but nobody will point her out to you because it's a little town. And uh, they want to be on good terms with her. It's just a kind thing, a considerate thing to do. So there's a, there's a, is there a protective mode, do you think? That oh, very much so. Oh, very much so. I, I, be, I think I mentioned in my book a BBC reporter came down there we would do one of those whatever happened to Harper Lee things. Right. And I brought a camera crew, and, and you know they were looking all around town for her. 
and uh, she, he, she ended up, he ended up at the country club having a buffet lunch a few chairs away from her. And uh, when uh, she left, uh, the uh, man who was escorting the BBC reporter around said, You missed your chance. She was right. Do you see that lady over there? That's hard for me. And he laughed. Fortunately, he took it, you know, in a good way. But he said, I can see why, why she's able to live this So the way. story was the lack of a story. The story was lack of a story. That little lady sitting there with the other little old lady sitting over there is the big news. Yeah. <laughs> Do you suspect there is something that is waiting to percolate after her demise? I, I would suspect, because uh, people I've spoken to who have received her letters, and that, that's one aspect of the book I was never able to get. Uh, there are some people who have collections of her letters, and they say that she, she writes very beautifully, even in an informal way, that her le letters are to be treasured. So I think at the very least we might see the letters of Harper Lee at some mm -hmm. point. The characters themselves, the study of the characters. Uh, did you get access to the actors who played those characters? You yes. talked about Mary and uh, yes, and Phil, Phil. And Phil Alford, who played Jem, right? Uh, the actor who played Dill passed away some time ago, okay. um, as have most of the other actors. Unfortunately, it was Brock. Brock alive? Peters, I ju I just missed. Yeah. He was ill, okay. too, too ill to do interviews. Um, most of the actors were were Broadway you know, stock characters, Broadway actors. Mm -hmm. To them, it was just one more role. Uh, you know, when we see the, the finished product, we see a story. To them, they were on, on site, on set for four days playing uh, the courtroom scene, right. something like that. It, it was not memorable. Um, I didn't need to interview Duvall because the National Endowment for the Arts interviewed him, and it's on the CD that accompanies the Big Read program, and that's about all the man remembers of the film. It was one of his first roles. He was a young, hungry actor. He stayed out of the sun for a few weeks to make himself pale and dyed his hair blonde so he'd look more angelic. Mm -hmm. that's, that's Harper Lee, probably. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, as, you will, as you do this, uh, part of the big read, and go to various locations, what's the most oft question you get asked? Um, let's see, the most oft asked question. Uh, people want to know who Jem was because after I explained that Harper Lee was Scout and Truman Capote was Dill, they say, well, then who's Jem? And they assume that it's her brother, Edwin. But Edwin was six years older than Nell. And, you know, six years when you're growing up is a big difference. Fourteen-year-olds don't play with eight-year-olds. Fourteen-year-olds are out playing baseball, and eight-year-olds have to stay in the yard. So it's, it, it was not Edwin. It was uh, Truman's cousin Jennings Carter, huh? who's still alive, as a matter of fact. He was a, made his living as a crop duster in Alabama. And he lived about a mile outside of town and used to walk into Truman's on weekends to have sleepovers at his cousin. Yeah. So the three of them, that little trio, was Jem Dillon Scout. They were very close in age, only a grade apart. Calpurnia? Calpurnia, uh, I, I missed her by a mile. She, uh, she passed away living with her son in California at an advanced age. Her name was Hattie Clausel, and she lived in what was called the Clausel neighborhood because it was a large extended family in the, in the black section of town. And Monroeville, like most southern towns, was segregated. And Hattie walked to the Lees. It was about a quarter mile early every morning where she was their, their house servant for six days a week, actually. There was that kind of symbiosis in the South between whites and black right. families. Is the sheriff Heck? Mm -hmm. but is there, there was such a person, uh, identifiable person? No, he seems to be a composite. Uh, you know, you have to be careful when you go down the avenue of looking at uh, autobiographical details that you don't argue a book is a memoir or that a book is an autobiography. It is fiction. I mean, she compressed several years into one. She compressed uh, one trial, you know, a couple of the details of several trials into one. Um, she conflated a few figures. Some are readily identifiable, what, whom I'll, and some of them I'll talk about in my talk. But uh, other, other people are just small town types. They're almost like um, 
like uh, st st stock characters. Right. Do you think she regretted writing the book since it brought her all this fame she didn't want? Well, I think um, that she regret writing the book. She did say to a friend that she was tired of talking about the bird. She didn't want to be asked any more questions about it. In fact, she was at a Christmas party sometime in the late 1980s and enjoying herself with friends. And a stranger, uh, an out-of-towner, spotted her, came up to her and said, Oh, Miss Lee, I just love your book. Now, about Atticus, she put down her drink and she left the party. It was ruined for her. I mean, she did not come there to talk about the novel. That was something that she'd done 40 years before. She came there to enjoy small-town talk with neighbors and fellow churchgoers and things like that. So that's the downside of having been very famous, is that you're rarely free of the onus, you know, of having been somebody. The upside is, is that it's given her freedom to do exactly as she pleases for the last 50 years. The woman has not had to do, has not had to work um, a nine to five type job since that book came out in 1960. She's a voracious reader. She's something of a, an amateur Southern historian. She loves to collect books and she loves to go to England. She won't fly. She'll only go by ship. She's afraid of, of flying. So she can do pretty much whatever she wants. Does she have a, uh, lack of a better term, a, not a significant other, be a long term, but a, a guy, friend who sort of escorts her? Um, well, she's, she's, uh, she's close to the reverend, the, the retired reverend in town. Um, but I was never able to find strong evidence of a romance in her life. If there was a, a real heartbreak in there somewhere that interfered with the writing of To Kill a Mockingbird or alternately inspired her to write To Kill a Mockingbird, I'd have to address it. Because, you know, many authors' lives have to do with, with love and lack of love. Apparently not so Harper Lee, right. at least not for the book that we know. Yeah. So I, I couldn't find ev any evidence of a great love, and I left it to one side. Make up your own mind. Regrets, as far as you're concerned, on, on the book itself, of, that, of subject matter that you wished you'd, you'd grabbed? Uh, the only thing uh, I think about several times a week is I don't like the first chapter. My father was a journalist, and he would warn me about writing something over and over again to the point where, and this was his phrase, where it smelled of the lamp. <laughs> In other words, that you know, it, it, it smelled of staying up late and it had the soot of the hurricane lamp on it, right, you know? Right, right. And uh, I, th my editor at that time had me rewrite the first chapter eight times. Mm -hmm. And by the time I got to the last draft, it could have been Swedish. I mean, I had seen those sentences and those facts so many times in so many di kinds of different syntaxes that I just finally turned it in, you know, and I can't bear to read it. Uh, the rest of the book went through four drafts, but the first chapter went through eight, and, and uh, I can't bear it. Just briefly, on, on the world of writing, mm -hmm. dealing with an editor, dealing with the publisher, what did you learn from that? Mm. Um, well, let's see, editors and publishers, speaking for me, it's, it's best for me to have an agent because uh, I'm not a good negotiator. I tend to be a compromiser, and publishing is business. You, I need someone on my side who understands 15-page contracts with arcane language, um, and my agent happens to be a, an attorney and somebody who loves books, so he represents me well. Um, what else did I learn about publishing? That um, you have to be a good collaborator. Mm -hmm. Publishing is not a place for people with thin skins. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to be willing to uh, take criticism in the best best of spirits, you know, best way you possibly can. And writing is a lonely profession. It's not for everyone. There are people who must be around other people. They like working for organizations. My, my father always worked for large organizations, and he was very much a people person. Um, I sit in a room, you know, for eight, nine hours a day looking at a screen. And it, um, sometimes it gets on my nerves, 
but by and large, I feel fortunate that I'm able to live my life the way I want to. We're thrilled that you're out in public <laughs> for tonight to uh, share the, your book and uh, about To Kill a Mockingbird. I know we dropped off something on, on Jackson mm -hmm. to you. Do you have any sent any time to even understand a little bit about Jackson and, and whether or not there's a... Oh, sure, yeah, but I, I feel like I'd be telegraphing a punch if I told you my, my uh, fit with um, To Kill a Mockingbird and Jackson. Why don't, why don't we leave it for my, my wind-up at the end? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Terrific. okay.